Okay, everybody, I want to go ahead and get started now. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, the Electronic Fundamentals course. My name is Ron Singleton, and of course, I'll be your professor, your teacher for the next, uh, for the summer, for the next 10 weeks. Um, I put up an announcement on Blackboard. Hopefully, you got a chance to uh, look at that. I'm assuming since you got the link to the class that you did look at that, but if you didn't, you want to make sure you go back to some information in there. Actually, I will go over some of that tonight, but make sure you look at that link, uh, the announcement. There is a, uh, a link for you to, uh, uh, to, to review. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with this uh, software called Collaborate, there's a link there that tells you just a little bit about what it is. So uh, what I want to do first is to go over a few things that you need for the class. You want to take out, if you don't have pen and paper, you will need tonight pen, paper, and a calculator. So I'll give you all pause for a second. If you don't have a pen or pencil, paper, and calculator, uh, go ahead and, and get that. And uh, while you're doing that, also, if you haven't had a chance to look at the, uh, our link on Blackboard, on Blackboard, when you go into our class, uh, there is a link called Course Documents. So anything you need for this class will be posted there. Anything that you need to hand in to me or upload to me will be posted there. There's only one place you have to go to. And that's the course document link. Um, you do want to uh, check often, since this is a web-based class, you do want to check. Uh, I know the scheduled time is 6 o'clock for us to meet, but uh, we don't necessarily have to meet at that time all the time. Some of these uh, lectures, we can kind of move around. Uh, we won't lecture for the whole time, every time. And some of the work will be required, will be required to do on your own at home. So this is kind of a fluid thing. So the point I'm trying to make is make sure you check the announcements uh, pretty much daily, at least during the day of the classes. So let's go over a few things you're going to need for the course. And uh, I do have a computer. I'm, I look over there. I can see uh, your icons, but I can't read. Uh, if you send a message to me, I can't read it. The computer is too far away. Uh, so if you have a question, you can feel free to interrupt me. What you do is that anytime you log on to collaborate, make sure your mics are muted. No video for now. And then uh, you can uh, unmute your mic if you have a question. Just ask me, interrupt me. I'll answer your question. You can remove mute your microphone. The reason for that is uh, I found that the, uh, the application Collaborate doesn't work very well. If we show videos and we have audio, everybody's mic opens. It bogs the system down and it doesn't work correctly. So, uh, But if you do have a question, please feel free to ask. Um, so, uh, the first thing is that make sure you look at the syllabus. So normally, if we're face to face, the first thing I would do is introduce myself, and then I would uh, go over the syllabus. And obviously, I can't do that. I can, you actually have the capability to do that using this uh, Collaborate software, but that uh, that uh, that doesn't work very well. So I, I leave it to you to go look at the syllabus. And if you have questions over anything on the syllabus, please ask me. Um, so what you will learn in this course, this course is for non-electrical majors. So you might be MET, or I know I have some software people that will take the course. If you're a non-electrical major, the course is for you if it's in your, uh, in your course of studies. We'll talk about, uh, for a good portion of the uh, course, we'll talk about DC circuits, and we'll talk about AC circuits. We start off talking about DC. And we spend quite a lot of time talking about DC circuits. DC stands for direct current, and that's the type of uh, electricity you get from a battery. And so we'll spend a lot of time learning about basic electrical principles using batteries. And once you get familiar with that and kind of comfortable with that, then towards the end of the semester, we'll move to AC circuits. AC stands for alternating current, and that's the kind of electricity you get out of the wall outlet say, at your house. And so we'll spend a little bit of time doing that. Now, uh, you know that a term normally for us, a semester is 15 weeks. And what they've done is they, for some reason, I don't know why, they've reduced it to 10 weeks and they've expanded the class time. We meet twice a week instead of once for, uh, for a certain amount of time. So, uh, I mean, it's not practical for me to lecture for four and a half hours. And definitely you don't want to listen to me talk for four and a half hours. So, Probably what's going to happen is some of the material, the AC material, I walk, I'll go through it, but I probably won't go into as much depth as, as I would as we were 
meaning for a 15 week term, but I'll make sure you get a good class. So um, the next thing that I want to talk about is attendance. Now, attendance turns out to be very important. I don't know if you guys know how, how it works for colleges, at least colleges in Ohio. Years ago, uh, the, the college was paid by the number of students that enrolled. Well, now colleges, Ohio colleges, are paid by the number of people who actually attend the class. And so it's very important that we take attendance and we take accurate attendance. Now, since we're doing this web-based thing, I don't have an attendance sheet. And I don't know if you're here or not. I mean, I know who's on the screen over there, but I, I basically can't take attendance like I would face-to-face. -face. So what I'm going to do for uh, tonight and probably other nights I'm going to have you guys text me. So if you have your cell phone, you don't have to do it right now, but here shortly, I'm going to have you text me some information. And I'm going to use that text as an attendance sheet. And I'll, I'll check you off if you're, if you're sending me the text. So it's important that you do that because what they do is during the first two weeks of class at Cincinnati State, if you don't sign in, if you, if you're not, if you don't sign in from, from the attendance, then it affects your financial aid. Ultimately, you, 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 you won't get any financial aid if they think you didn't attend school. So it's very important that you send me uh, a text and I'll count as an attendance. And when, anytime I ask for that, it's important, especially during the first two weeks of class, that I know that you're present. So turn that into the office and they know that uh, you get financial aid. If you get financial aid, it won't affect it. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is stuff that, you, what, what will you need for the class? There's a few items that I did list in the announcement. So here's where you want to write this stuff down. And again, it is in the announcement, but I have a chance to explain now what this stuff is. One of the things I ask you to get is a three ring binder and a three hole punch. And I said it's required, but I'll leave it up to you whether you want to get it or not. I highly recommend it because uh, uh, there's a lot of papers, uh, the things that I'll upload to Blackboard, and if, you, if, you, if you're okay working off of a screen, then you're probably okay doing without the three-ring binder, but I think it works or has worked for me better if you print this stuff out and you three-hole punch it and you put it in the binder, binder especially since uh, we don't really have a, well, we have a text, but I'm not going to, I don't think the text is the greatest. So I kind of more work, I use the text for reference and work mainly off my notes. And so if you have a three ring binder, you can print out everything as I post it to the board, put it in there, and then what you end up with is a nice book or text type book that you can study for quizzes or, or whatever, homework or whatever it is that you're doing. So uh, I, I said I require a three ring binder and a three hole punch. Obviously I can't make you buy it or I don't know if you have it, but I highly recommend it for keeping papers in order and that you can print out and kind of keep stuff in order and write on and all of that. Now, the other thing you will need for lab, normally we would meet in a physical lab and we have all the equipment. Well, obviously we won't do that for summer, so how are we gonna do labs? What we did last semester when I talked to class is we did simulation software. We did, uh, we did labs on a simulator. Um, they, department chose to do hands-on lab and the only way to do that is to you guys have to have the equipment so get the equipment well the college has purchased for this class uh, these uh, these are called analog digital trainers they purchased I think 30 of them and I think we only have 11 students so there's some extra ones so we have these uh, these these trainers basically you can think of it as a portable lab you have pretty much everything you need there except for one thing to carry out the lab so you need to do that now you guys are lucky because you can you they bought 30 of them and they're going to loan them to you um the actual electrical students who have electrical majors they actually have to purchase this device and it's not it's not cheap so you guys don't have to buy it they're going to loan it to you but you do have to go pick it up from the school and i'll let you know when those are available they're not available right i think they come as kits and they have people building, building them right now, if I'm not mistaken. And when they become available, it'll be soon. I'll let you guys know. And then you got to schedule time to go up there to pick them up. And at that time, I'll tell you when you can pick them up and where you will go to pick them up. So you will need an analog digital trainer, but that's not anything you have to buy. This, the college is going to loan that to you, and then you'll return it at the end of the uh, summer semester. The other thing you'll need along with that trainer is parts. So when you get your 
when you go pick up your analog digital trainer, you want to make sure you give they'll, they should give you a packet with all the electrical components that you'll need to do the labs that you can take home with you. So it should be two things you get from the school. You want to get the analog digital trainer, and it should give you a packet of all the parts you'll need to do the lab. So I'll have more information uh, as I get information. I'll give you guys more information about that. Uh, right now, I don't know where they are on it. I'll, I'll check probably sometime before the next week. Uh, this week, there won't be a physical lab. I do have a lab alignment for you, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Now, uh, the other thing you will need to purchase, though, is a meter. I don't think they're going to loan you meters. It's a meter that you'll need. And actually, uh, other than the analog digital trainer, this meter is, is important to have. It's the most used electrical device for testing and for lab work. Uh, so you, you definitely got to have it. That's the bad news. The good news is they're very, they're very inexpensive. You can probably pick a meter up for anywhere between, uh, I've seen them as cheap as 10 bucks. I think I bought one. I bought one uh, not quite a year ago from Lowe's. I bought one, uh, I think, for about 20 bucks. The meter is called a digital multimeter. And your, your first lab, you're actually going to do some research meters. That's the first lab assignment that I have posted for you. Actually, I'll send it to you. So I want you to study the meter so you know what you're buying. But you will need a meter, not right away. You don't need it like this week. But you will need that meter. The meter has the ability or will have the ability to measure voltage, to measure current, and to measure resistance. And we'll have to measure all those quantities in lab. So you'll, you'll definitely need the meter. Now, they may have meters to loan you. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll check on that. And hopefully by the next time when we get together, I can let you know if I have one, ones that you can, um, they can loan you along with the trainer. But I, I'm, I'm, I think I got a text or email saying that you need to purchase it. So I wouldn't run out and buy it like tonight. Wait until you hear from me again. For now I'm going to say that you need to buy the meter. If you do, in fact, need to buy it, um, the department sent me a link to a uh, website that sells a particular type that they recommend. Uh, I don't know how much it is, 20 or 30 bucks. Um, you don't have to use that one. Again, you can buy them almost any hardware will sell a digital multimeter. Definitely below in the Home Depot, they sell them. And again, uh, I wouldn't spend much more than 20 bucks on one. If you do, uh, you know, hopefully you'll use it more than just for this class. And, and honestly, they do come in handy. Once you learn some stuff that we're going to talk about in the class, you can actually use the meter to test and to fix stuff. So it really doesn't hurt to have it. But I'll let you know more about that uh, later when I find out uh, when they're going to have the analog digital trainers uh, together. I'll, I'll let you know if you actually have to purchase that digital multimeter or if they have meters that they can loan you. If you do have to purchase the meter, you want to make sure you get a digital meter and not an analog meter. The, the difference is a digital meter is going to have numbers that light up, an LED display. An analog me uh, meter will have a, a needle that moves back and forth. You don't want that one. You want the digital one. But again, we'll wait and we'll see what the school has for you. And then uh, when, we are, when we get closer, probably you won't need it this week. You probably won't need it next week. But around the third week, I start doing some hands on the lab. But between then and now, I have some other stuff for you to do. So three ring binder and hole punch, you need that. Analog digital trainer, you need that. But the school's going to loan it to you. The digital multimeter, you need that. You're probably going to have to buy it, but there's a possibility that the school will loan it to you. I'll let you know more on that later. Um, if you think you might want to use the meter, for uh, I know you might be a hobbyist if you have other uh, interest in, elect in electronics or, or, or elect electrical engineering, you can go ahead and buy it, and then you already have it. You can use it for other things. In addition to those items, you will need a set of coloring pencils or pens with at least four colors. The reason for that is in this class, we draw, we draw a lot of what we call di di electrical diagrams or schematic diagrams. And to solve engineering problems, electrical engineering problems, color coding becomes important. It kind of helps you uh, see things a little bit better if you code it, color code it. So uh, I, I recommend getting at least four colors, either four coloring pencils. You can get one of those ink pens that has multi-colors on it, four or five colors. 
Uh, don't limit yourself to four or five. The more colors you have, the better. And then around the you know, third week of the class, we'll start using those and you'll see why they're important and how they can help you out. So you do need a set of coloring pens or pencils. You also need either to have a printer or you need access to a printer. Now I know that's been last summer or last semester when I taught, there was it was an issue for some students. Um, they didn't have a printer and they didn't have access to a printer. You do need that. I mean, I'm gonna. There's no way around it because uh, what I what we what you gotta be able, be able to do is I gotta be able to post a document to Blackboard. You gotta be able to print it out. You can't just have it in like a Word software or something because you're gonna have to draw diagrams and write math on it and all of that. And there's just no convenient way to do that in the application like Word that I'm aware of. So you have to have the ability to print. So you need you need to have a printer or you need access to a printer. You gotta be able to print documents out. In addition to, to printing the documents out, you gotta be able to turn the documents in to me. And the way you'll do that is through Blackboard. You'll upload anything that I assign you, be sent back to me through Blackboard. Not through email, through Blackboard. I only accept assignments as a PDF. So the last thing you'll need is a way to convert a document to PDF. Now, some of you might have a scanner. If you can scan the PDF, PDF that, that works just fine for me. If you don't have a scanner, uh, there is an app I'll tell you about later that you can actually put on your cell phone and take a picture of a document, and it cuts out the background, and it saves the document as a PDF. You can hand stuff in that way. But you've got to have the ability to convert some kind of way, convert a file from a regular file to a PDF file. The... Um, if you have some kind of other way of doing it, maybe some other app, as long as you end up with the end result as a PDF, you can use whatever you want to use, but you got to have the ability to do that so that you can turn and work to me. Um, so that's what you'll need for the class. Do I have any questions over that list I just went over about what you need? Okay. Um, how the class... This is a web class, so how will this class work? Well, the first thing to note is I'm going to record all the lectures. All, everything will be recorded, but you still require, if I say that the lecture is a live stream, that means you need to be here and I'm going to take attendance. I don't want the fact that I'm recording it to say, all right, I don't have to really worry about attending the class because you're going to record it. I'll just go back and, and watch the recording. Um, that really doesn't work because this class, you really need to kind of, as we work problems and do concepts and different things, you got to be able to ask questions and see what I'm doing. And with the video, you can't do that. So you really need to attend. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna record and make a video of everything that we talk about. If you miss a class, of course, go back and watch the video. But the video is more for if you want to watch something over again. Maybe you didn't quite get it the time we went through. You can go back and you can rewatch it. So, you know, things happen. If things do happen and you miss class, the video is a fallback, but don't replace the video with coming to the class. That's a big mistake if you want to get a good grade in the class. You want to be here, participate, and be able to uh, ask me questions and ask each other questions. And by the way, you know, on the collaborate, as I'm talking, as you guys are working, you're able to send messages back to each other. And everybody can see that. So if something's not clear, you can text to the, the, the application. You can ask questions of each other. Help each other to figure stuff out as I do stuff on the board. Um, if you catch me making a mistake, I, I, I was working the problem yesterday and I made a mistake, and just feel free to say, hey, I think that's wrong, or go back and check, whatever. If you catch me with a mistake, you know, chime in, just interrupt me and say, hey, I think what you did is wrong. Let me know. So this is a two-way thing. Even though you guys, your mics are, are muted right now and I'm not seeing the video, um, if you need to say something, just open your mic up, say what you got to say and then close your mic back so we don't have any disturbance. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? Well, what I'm going to do is take out your cell phone, and this is for attendance. And I want you to text me, and I need you to text me your uh, first name, and your last name. Text me your phone 
last name, and then in the text, you want to put EET 101. And if you have your student number, that would be nice. So I know it's really you. First and last name, EET 101, and your student number. If you don't know your student number, if you want to put your social security number there, you can. Um, I know some people don't like giving out their social security number. I'm the only one that will see it, but I need some way of knowing that it's actually you texting in the future. I need to know. And I do have your uh, your uh, student numbers, but I don't. I, I need. I would like it in a text. So I think it's on your student ID card. If you have it or your schedule, it should be on that. So text it. You're going to text it to uh, the number 513-494-6162. So it's very important. Go ahead and text me right now. First and last name, EET101, and your student number or your, your Social Security number, text me. And this is for attendance purposes. And what I'll do at the end of the class, I'll go and I'll write it down. I'll check everybody off who sends me a text as being here. And again, you want to make sure you do that, especially the first two weeks of class. If you don't, then your financial aid will be canceled or at least uh, it won't work out for you in a good way. So I'll pause a few minutes, let you go ahead and get your phones and text it, and then um, we'll continue on with the class. While you guys are doing that, so I have my name here, uh, Ron Singleton. You can call me Ron. Uh, just a little bit about me. I've been, uh, well, I've been teaching since 1996. I graduated from college in 1996 with a degree in physics and a degree in uh, electronics and a degree in uh, general studies or liberal arts. And uh, I started teaching right away at a school. I've taught... Uh, college since 1996 and I actually taught high school math advanced math for I think about four or five years um, I'm a full-time professor at Cincinnati State full-time tenure professor at Cincinnati State and I'm a adjunct professor of electrical engineering and mechanical engineering at uh, UC I've been at UC I think since 1999 so I've been around a while uh, in the science and technology uh, area, so um, I guess I got a little bit of experience. So that's that's my story. But you can call me Ron, um, first name basis, and uh, it's kind of hard for me to get to know you guys. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to there's going to be a quiz every week. If you read the syllabus, you saw that quiz this week. I think what I'm going to do is this first quiz is just going to be something where you kind of just introduce yourself to the class. So I see a couple people are connecting by phone, and when you connect by phone, I don't know if you have the ability. I don't think you have the ability to share video, so I don't know what we're going to do there. But what I'll do is send you a set of questions uh, that are talking points, and then the next time we get together, you just come on camera, turn your mic on, and you're not you're talking to me and the class. I want to introduce yourself. So it'll just be a few, maybe 30 seconds of talking, and that way we can kind of get a feel for who's in the class. I'm going to count it as a quiz grade. Now, I did something I've never done before in my life. I told you I've been teaching since 1996, and I've always my classes are always structured the same way. I always have four exams. I have a quiz every week, homework, and labs, and I have them weighted out a certain way, a certain percentage. Um, well, today I decided for your class, and only your class, I kind of did away with the exams, and I'm going to try this and see how it works. And so the weight of the exams went to quizzes. It actually might work better now that I think about it. The way it usually works is the quizzes, you go through and you have a quiz every week, and that's kind of for you. And then you have this exam, which goes over everything you were quizzed over, but it's, like, really heavily weighted. And then you take the exam, and then once you take the exam, we move on to the next body of material until you get to the next exam. And we do that four times because there's four exams. But I'm going to try something new with you guys. 
I did away with the exams. There won't be any exams. There'll just be these quizzes that you do, and I'll give you one every week. Uh, some of them will be, uh, those will just be different. Some of them will be just short answer quizzes that you'll do and you can submit right away. Some I'll give you a few days to do and you can upload it to Blackboard. But I'm going to try this and see what happens. I think it'll work out better. One reason I feel good about doing that is they, they've done some, they, they shortened the time for the class. It's the same amount of time hours wise. I mean, they went from 15 weeks to 10 and they doubled the classes up. We meet twice a week instead of once a week. So if you count the number of hours, it's still the same. But there's no way students can sit and listen to me talk, or there's no way I can do a four and a half hour video twice a week, and that's just for one class. I got three classes and one at UC. It's impossible. So some of this stuff you do on your own. So I just think it'll, it'll be it's more practical to just get cover a little bit of material and then just test you over it and just get that out the way. Get your grade for it and we'll move on. So the test moved from being, the, the quizzes moved from being worth, uh, I think I, they were worth 15% for quizzes. Now they're worth 60% of the classes, I believe, is what they're set for. So I'm saying that to say the quizzes are going to be pretty important that you, that, you, that you get the quizzes. Now here's the good thing about the quizzes. Two things. Number one, uh, I don't curve, I don't give make up anything, but if you miss a quiz or you get a low grade on the quiz, I drop the two low quizzes. That's big because now the quizzes are worth 60%. So I drop the two lowest quizzes. So you can totally not take or totally fail or do bad on two quizzes, won't affect your grade at all. In addition to dropping two quizzes, I'll give other assignments that are pretty much easy to do. I'll give you one tonight. It's pretty easy to do. If you do it, you're guaranteed to get 100 points. If you do it and do a good job on it, on it, you get 100 points and it'll count as a quiz grade. I really do think that the way this is now with the quizzes and doing away with the exams, I think it's going to work in your favor as long as you as you do the work. Now, having said that, if I give you like a, I call it extra credit, and I hate to use that terminology because when I say that, Students think it's extra credit. I don't really have to do it. Well, this extra credit, you got to do it because I got to put a grade in the grade book. And if you don't do it, you get a zero. And if a zero, zero is going to count as a zero quiz grade, which is going to pull you down. So you have a really good chance. I mean, this last semester when I taught this course, they weren't lucky like that. There were four exams. There was a quiz every week. It was a lot more rigid. But we started off meeting face to face. I just think with all that's going on right now, uh, we'll just take it easy. This, uh, this I want to say semester, but a semester is 15 weeks. It's really a quarter, 10 weeks. We'll take it easy. So just to make a long story short, make sure you go read the syllabus and read it carefully so you can see how things are weighted, so you can see that I, how, how, how I read it. If you have any questions or issues about the uh, syllabus, please feel free to, uh, to let me know. And by the way, uh, as far as contacting me, this number right here, I do not have a cell phone, but I, I do have this number, which is, a if you know what Google Voice is, it's a Google Voice number. You can text it. On the syllabus, I give this number. So if you need to get a hold of me, there's two ways to do it. You can text this number or you can email me. If you email me, I'll eventually email you back, but it won't be right away. It may not even be the same day. If you text me, it won't be right away because it's not a cell phone, it's a computer, but you will get a text back that same day. So the fastest way to get a hold of me is text. If it's not an emergency and you just want to send me a message, you can email and leave it up to you. If you text me, since I have three classes at Cincinnati State and one at UC, other people texting that number, make sure you identify yourself. Say, hey, this is Joe Blow. I'm in your uh, fundamental cl class at Cincinnati State, and then ask me your question. So this is a good way. Write that down. It is on the syllabus, but write it down if you're taking notes. This is a way to contact me for any issues or problems with the course. Um, the other thing I want to say about the course is, uh, so we're doing this web thing. And uh, I'm, I'll be honest, I tried to take a web class. Because me as a teacher at UC, I can take classes for free. So they had, I'm an I'm a old school dude. I like to sit in front of a teacher. I like students around me. I like to be face to face. But I tried this web class, uh, I don't know, five, six years ago. 
and I hated it. I hated the online class. It's just what I wasn't. It wasn't. It was just didn't work for me. You got to be more. You got to really be on your P's and Q's. Be motivated. You got to show up. And some of this stuff you got to do on your own. Some of the stuff we, we, we will do in class. And then when it comes to learning, I just like to. Uh, I just. I just like. I like to have a real person in front of me. Well, we were served this virus thing, and nobody asked for it. So we got what we got to work with, which is this web thing. So I'm just grateful and feel blessed that we're able to to to, to continue the whole class. I'm saying this to you to say this. If you need to meet me face to face, let's say you just you're not getting the stuff. You, you know, we I, we tried to do it through the web. We tried to do it on the phone. I can show you problems on the board, but you just gotta you need some tutoring face to face. I am willing to meet you. We can't go to the school. I don't know where we would go. We gotta find a common place, and uh, I'm, I'm willing to do that if we need to do that, either individually or if we need to meet as a group to go stuff. I'm willing to do that. I can really see that happening with the lab. When you guys get the digital trainers, you might be confused. But I'm going to try to show you some kind of way through video how to hook stuff up. But I can't see the, a time where we might need to get together and you actually physically see and touch the stuff and, and talk face to face. So we'll see how that works out. I'm just letting you know I'm, if you get stuck and you say, hey, I need I, we need to get together face to face. I, I, we can make that happen. So I'll make it happen. We got to meet somewhere outside of the school. We got to make sure that if you know if there's more than a couple people, uh, I'll wear a mask anyway. But if you have a mask and we do the social distancing thing, you, you know about all of that. So that is an option if we need to go there. We'll see how the summer. We'll see how it works out. So with that, I think um, I think that's everything I want to say. It seems like it was one thing. Oh. Um, I think I mentioned the quiz already. Yeah, I, want, I, I mentioned it already, but the quiz, I'm going to send you an assignment, just a set of questions that you can write the answers to, like your name, write your name down, your major, write your major down, and a few talking points. And then next time we get together, I want you to turn your camera on and just talk a little bit so we can kind of get a feel for who's in the class. And when you do that, I want to record that as a quiz grade, 100 points. So going into um, the week, you should have a quiz with 100 points on it. And that's going to be the easiest 100 points that you earn from me. So we'll do that next time. So does anybody have any questions before we start? Um, I actually do uh, about the uh, quizzes. Um, are we going to do those during class time, or are those going to be any time? I mean, how are those going to be set up? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me, let me look at it like this. So normally what I do, if we were face-to-face, I walk into class once a week, usually on the Monday, because this class is usually taught on Monday. Usually on the Monday, I walk in, and the first thing I do is hand out the quiz and give you 10 minutes to do it. And you would do it, you hand it in, and then we start teaching. Well, now uh, that model is just totally, it won't work. So it works kind of nice at UC, because UC moved from Blackboard to something called Canvas. So through Canvas, uh, Canvas is kind of like Blackboard, but better. Um, I have the ability to create a quiz online, and in some cases, the quiz is self-grading. So what I've done, at, what you see is use Canvas. So I'll say, all right, the first 10 minutes of class, we're going to have a quiz. They go, they take the quiz online, and then once the quiz is over, the quiz is set to expire in 10 minutes, and 10 minutes into the class, when the quiz is expired, then, um, then uh, we start our lecture. Uh, now, Blackboard, from what I understand, I've never set up a quiz on Blackboard before. Uh, so I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to see how hard it is. I hear it's kind of difficult. Um, so we'll see. So right now, um, right now, here's what I have proposed for right now. Some of the quizzes you'll do and you'll upload them right away. It just depends. You'll, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on Blackboard. That's a, another reason why you want to have the ability to print. Or even if you don't print it, you can you can write it down. I don't care if you write 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 the answers down. A lot of what we do will be circuit diagrams anyway, so you can write and then, then submit it to me. But you got to have a way of scanning it and uploading it to Blackboard. So to answer your question directly, some of them will be you know I'll give you I'll I'll, I'll send you the quiz like right away before lecture and say you have ten minutes to do it. You'll submit it back. You'll upload it to me. If you don't upload it in the whatever the uh, time limit is, you'll miss 
you'll miss the opportunity to upload it because the link will expire. Some of the quizzes, though, I'll just give it to you. Like, I might give it to you today and say, all right, this is due on Friday. This is due on Sunday or something like that. It will be a mixture. It won't be one way. What's going to determine that is the material that we do. If it's something like, uh, like the thing where you're going to introduce yourself, I'm doing that for two reasons. Reason number one, I want to get a feel for who's in the class, and I want you guys to know each other a little bit. But reason number two, I want everybody to go into the first week of class with an A. So that's a guaranteed A. So that quiz is going to be kind of, you just text me. I mean, you, you're going to get on here and, and talk a little bit, and I'm going to write off, they check, you did it, you got 100 points. If I'm doing the diagram of them and the problem requires some math, um, you require some time to do it, you might just print that out, do the math, I'll give you a couple days to do it, and then you'll upload the blackboard when you're done, some kind of way, either through the app, phone app or scan it some kind of way. If I can figure out how the um, blackboard quiz systems work, I may try a little of the things that you can do on blackboard right away. Although, to be honest with you, in engineering, uh, you know, multiple choice questions and true. I really don't like doing that. I mean, I, I don't. I don't think that's a good way to teach a technical course. But it's the only way we can do it. Right. Now. Most of what you do will be done at home, and you'll upload it to me. So some will be due right away. I'll give you like ten minutes or so to do it. You'll upload it to me. Probably the majority of them, you'll be able to have a day or two or a couple of days to do it, and then you'll upload them to me. Any other questions? Now, you guys, I have, uh, let's see, I got two, I got four people by phone, and I don't, what I, all I see on my screen is I see icons, because your cameras are off, of the people that are, are logged in through the link, and the phone people, all I see is a plus four, I don't, it's just one thing that says plus four on it, and so I don't know if you have the ability to talk to me, or uh, I'm assuming you can see me, I know you can hear me. But uh, I think you can text each other. You can message each other. So if you're on the phone, if you call in, uh, if you have to ask me a question, you don't have the ability to do it through your phone thing, just text it and have someone else that can ask me. People who have actually called LinkedIn through the link, they can, you can send them a message out and say, hey, ask them this, and they can, they can ask you a question. So if any of you four people that called in, that phoned in, if you have a question, just send a text to somebody in the class. I think when you send the message, everybody can see it. And if you have a question for me, say, hey, ask him this, and now I'll, I'll address your question. So does anybody else have any questions before we start? OK. Um, all right, so two things to look for. Uh, look for the first the questions for the first quiz, which is just you introducing yourself. And also, there'll be some kind of homework assignment that I give you pretty much every week. And some of it will be like really simple stuff. You might go on the web and do something. Other things will be a document that I give you and you actually have to do some work. So just kind of look for that. Long story short, if you watch, if you look, just kind of check Blackboard often and I'll direct you and then we'll, you know, we'll see how that works out. I feel pretty good about it. I'm not a big fan of this 10 week thing. I just think it's too hard on the students and it's hard on the teachers, but that's what they gave us, so that's what we got to work with. All right, so if you don't have questions, make sure you have pen and paper. And let's go ahead and get started. So I don't know if you had a chance to look at Blackboard yet, but if you look at Blackboard, there's a link that says Course Documents. And then if you click that link, you'll see two things. The first thing you'll see is the syllabus. And right under that, you'll see something that says, I believe it says module one. See, normally when I teach, I have everything broken out by weeks, but because, <clears throat> excuse me, because we have such a short time, I'm going to do this in modules. And the module to me is just a group of information, a group of chapters. Think of it like that. So uh, if you looked at that, though, you'll notice inside of that module one folder, under today's date, there's a, uh, there's a file called a topic sheet. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, make sure you look at it. Really, if you print, you want to print that out if you have the ability to print. You want to print that out. What that is is an outline of the chapter that we're going to talk about. 
And that's important because I base the quiz on topic sheets. So if you have the topic sheet, if you understand everything on the topic sheet, then you probably do you probably do okay on the quizzes. In addition to an outline of the chapter, there's also usually practice problems that we go through in class. So you want to print out the topic sheets ideally before class and have that kind of with you as I'm lecturing. Now I didn't tell you to do that for the first one, so you may not have it, but that's okay because I, I kind of wrote it out by hand. I have everything on the topic sheet that we're going to do on the board here. But just in the future, you might want to have that printed out. If you don't, it's okay. I'll, I'll go over everything on the board, but it's just it's kind of nice to have that topic sheet in front of you, and you can see where I'm going to go to next and that kind of thing. But if you do have the topic sheet, the very first thing on that topic sheet is they talk about mathematics. They talk about math, or as mentioned, math, mathematics. And it talks about math as being the language of science and engineering. So I just want to say a little bit about that, and then I'm going to move into the next topic. So in science and engineering, especially in science and engineering, um, well, just in general, let me start like this. In general, you know, there's many, many, I hope you know there's many, many ways to communicate. I mean, I'm communicating with you right now. I'm looking at a camera. I'm talking to you. And I'm communicating with you in the sense that what I mean by communicating is I have these ideas and concepts. I have something in my mind I want to get across to you. I, I got, I can say, I can talk to you using words and you understand what I'm saying. So whatever I have, I can give to you through words. And that's one way we can communicate through words. But not the only way we can communicate. We can communicate a lot of ways. One, one way we can communicate is, uh, Body language. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a mom, a dad, you can just, your mom, you can look at her face probably and tell if she's upset. She don't have to say anything. Just by looking at her, her expression, you can say, hey, that person's upset. So by body language, that's another way to communicate. You can communicate through art. You can communicate things and ideas through music, through poetry. There's a lot of ways to communicate. Well, just as you can communicate using music or poetry or words, you can communicate using the language of mathematics. So on that topic sheet, the very first thing I have is that mathematics is the language of science and engineering. Now, I start, you might say, well, why, why are you even talking about that? Well, it's important that you understand I'm saying that math is a language. Many people, when they have, when you think of math, you think of arithmetic, you think of algebra, if you're real smart, one of those smart dudes or, or girls, you might think of calculus or differential equations. You think of numbers and stuff like that. Most people don't think of math as a language. A language is used to communicate ideas. And I'm asking you now to now look at math as not numbers or some formula you put numbers into to get an answer out. Math is how we can make, matter of fact, there's this uh, philosopher you might know Rene Descartes is a philosopher. He's the one that says, I think, therefore I am. Rene Descartes said that math is the language God gave us to allow us to communicate with nature. Math is the language God gave us to allow us to communicate with nature. In other words, we live in the mathematical universe. I know where the moon is going to be. If I want to send a rocket to the moon, I got to know where it's going to be when that rocket gets there. I can calculate that. I can communicate with nature using math. And so as we go through this course, I'll write equations on the board. And you'll, 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 you'll have your equation sheet. You'll be able to put numbers in it, get your calculator, and get an answer. But I'm asking you to look at math a different way. I'm asking you to look at math as a language. And so when you see a formula, yeah, you have a formula to get an answer. But what you really want to ask is, what is that formula trying to say to me? It's speaking to you. It's trying to give you information. And what you'll find, at least the way I teach this, is formulas are important. Those variables are important. But what's more important than the formula is the relationship between the variables. And so I'll show you examples of that around probably around next week or week three. We're going to have to do a little bit more mathematical stuff. So the first thing on that topic sheet is that for us, math just ain't some – stuff you do with numbers, for us, us meaning you and me now since we're in this class, math is a language 
and we use languages to communicate. Now, let me say this real quick and then we'll move on. Why is it that scientists use math and engineers use math to communicate? They could use words. I mean, they use some words. I mean, they can use words, they use pictures, but the, the main way scientists communicate is mathematically. So why is it that the, 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 the uh, language of choice for scientists and engineers is math? Well, there's many reasons, but there's two main reasons. Reason number one is that math is universal. Math is universal. What does it mean to be universal? That means that it's the same everywhere, no matter where you go. You can't say that about everything. Like, for example, you can't say that about, like, art. So you I have art. I can look at a piece of artwork and think there's a bunch of a four-letter word that begins with an S and ends with a T. You might look at it and say, man, that's a great word. I look at Picasso's painting. You know, they're worth millions of dollars, and they look like a kid could do it to me. I'm not moved by that. So um, you can interpret a lot, right? And, and then the same with history. I mean, history, um, it's not the same for everybody. I mean, if you, if you ask the average American who discovered America, most people will say Christopher Columbus. But if you ask the real Americans, the Native Americans who are already here, they wouldn't say it was Christopher Columbus. There's all kind of there's African American history, there's European history, there's Asian history. It just depends on what side of the pond you're on. But that's not true of math. With math, two plus two is four no matter where you are. Two plus two is four in Cincinnati, two plus two is four, two plus two is four in China. If you go to the moon, two plus two is four. With math, it's universal, it's the same everywhere, and scientists and engineers need that. We communicate, we need for this thing to be the same for me and the same for you, so that we know we're talking about the same thing. We're looking at it the same way. So one reason we use math as a language in science and engineering is because it's universal. The second important reason we use math as a language and not some other language is that uh, it's precise. It's precise. Now, what does it mean to be precise? Well, usually in science, what we do, what, what scientists try to do is understand nature. And how do they do that? Well, what they do is they usually do some kind of experiment and they get data. Why do they get the data? Well, they get the data because they want to ultimately turn the data into some kind of knowledge. And often what they do is they'll take measurements, and from the measurements, they do experiments and take more measurements, and they end up with some kind of graph. And then with the, from that graph, they can derive an equation. And with that equation, now we can make predictions. So that's kind of that's, that's how it works. But how do we get the data? I don't care if you're a biologist, a physicist, a chemist, or no matter what one of those kind of scientists you are, the way you get data is by measuring. You have to measure something. Even you. I said that one of the things you'll need for the class is a digital multimeter. That's the most important piece of equipment you can have as an electronic technician, an engineer, because that's that, that thing right there you can measure in three quantities we'll spend the whole semester talking about, voltage, current, and resistance. So science, you have to make measurements. And so uh, when we talk about precise, you can only be as precise as the instrument you have to make that measurement. And so some of our instruments are really precise now, really precise. And so I can get really precise data, which gives me really precise information. Some of our instruments might not be so precise. So why math as a language is universal? Same everywhere, it's precise, as precise as our measuring devices allow us to be. So those are the reasons for that. Anyway, I want to talk about something called scientific notation. And I know for a lot of you, you've already seen this before. So the thing about this is that probably most of you have seen this before, but not everybody has. So when I teach, I assume you don't know anything. So Please don't be bored by what I'm going to do. If you've seen it before, just kind of sit back and look at it as a review. If you've never seen it before, then it's not really that bad. Just try to learn from it. We're going to use it. Really, scientific notation just kind of gets, steps us closer to where we want to be, which is engineering notation. We'll talk about both of those tonight. So let's start with scientific notation. My 
My spelling is not the best tonight for some reason. Scientific notation, what is it? Scientific notation is a way of expressing either really big numbers or really small numbers using a form that looks like this. You have a decimal point, and you'll, you'll have a number to the left of the decimal point, and you may or may not have a number to the right of the decimal point. And this number right here, it's got to be one of these digits, one through nine. It cannot be a zero. Times 10 to some power. And what that power tells you, the exponent, you got to start with a decimal number. And the exponent is going to tell you the number of times decimals move. To get it into this form right here. And so you've probably seen numbers written this way before, even if you're not aware of scientific notation. You might have seen something like uh, 6.25 times 10 to the south. That's scientific notation. Notice that I have a decimal point. I got one place to the left of the decimal point, And that one place is one of these digits, one through, one through nine. And so this you got to be able to do. Now, why do we use scientific notation? The reason scientists use scientific notation is, as I said, scientists deal with extremely large numbers, big numbers. And just kind of as an example, just to get your mind, and this kind of this kind of feeds into, I want to give you an extra credit assignment tonight, or at least by next class. This will kind of feed into that. Let's talk about big numbers that a scientist might, might um, might deal with. My background is in physics, and so let's deal with something in cosmology or physics. Um, like, I don't know, let's deal with uh, stars and planets. And let's think about, let's think about the Earth and the Sun. Does anybody know the distance between the Earth and the Sun? There's the Sun. I'll put the Earth over here. Anybody know the distance between the two? 94 million miles. Yep. Well, but 93, 94, 95, I'll go with that. That's fine. Let's just go with 93. We'll go with any of those. So around 93, 94 million miles. Now, uh, when I say that, <laughs> You might not kind of get a feeling for that because you guys, you use GPS. I don't have a cell phone. I don't have GPS. I don't have any of that stuff. I use a map. And I, I know it doesn't look like it, but I used to be a runner back in the day. I'm a, I can't run around the block right now. But back when I was in my 20s, I ran at least six miles a day or more, six days a week. And I know I, right now in my house where I live right now, I'm four miles from downtown. I live in Bond Hill near Norwood. And from my house to Fountain Square is four miles. And I will run from this house downtown and back, and I do that. So I know what a mile is, but I don't have a feeling for that right there. That's a, that's, that's a lot of miles, 93 million miles. Now, let's, let's think about that, though. Anybody know how fast light travels? How fast does light travel? One of my favorite people on the planet was Albert Einstein. And, uh, you know, you have these constants that they use in science, like for, for, uh, for the concept for pi, 3.14, or for that e to the x, e has a constant, as a value. Einstein used a symbol c to represent the speed of light. And the speed of light is, a, is about 186,000 miles per, you probably think I'm going to say miles per hour, but I'm not, is 186,000 miles per second. That's three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. 300 million meters per second. That's pretty daggone fast. Now, I don't know what the circumference of the Earth is, but I know if you turn on the light bulb and then you can go around the Earth, 
It'll go around the earth many, 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 many times in one second. That's pretty fast. But even at that speed, 186,000 miles a second. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and look at the sun. But if you did, if you went out and looked at the sun, if a photon of light left the sun to come here, maybe here's your eye, you wouldn't see that for 8.3 minutes. 8.3 minutes. It takes light traveling at that rate, 186,000 miles per second, it takes light eight minutes to reach from the sun to the earth. That's a big distance. Going that fast, eight minutes is a long time. That's a huge distance. Think about it like this. If you were looking at the sun, which again, I don't recommend doing, but if you were looking at it and say God went like this, God said, I'm going to put the sun out. And he put the sun out. You still see the sun for eight minutes because the light right before the sun was put out, the light that left it will take eight minutes to get to your eye. Now, if you think deeply about that, that's kind of interesting because what that says is this. You can never really see things as they are. You can only see in the past. If it takes eight minutes for the light to leave the sun and get to your eye, when it gets to your eye, you're seeing the sun as it looked eight minutes ago, not in the present. It takes eight minutes to get to your eye. Well, the sun is a, hope you know, it's a star. And it's 93 million miles away from us. The next closest star, I don't know if you know the name of it. Anybody know the name of the next closest star? It's Alpha what? Alpha? Centauri. Exactly. And that star is, get this. Think about this. For some called a light year. And what the heck is a light year? A light year. A light year is a distance. It's not a speed, it's a distance. A light year is a distance that light will travel in one year. Now, you got to really think about this. Look how fast light travels. 300 million meters a second. 186. Think of something. Think of something traveling at 186,000 miles a second. Just think of that. That fast. 186,000 miles per second. If it just traveled for a few seconds, it's went a long way. But what you got to do to get this distance of one light year, you got to take that 186,000 miles per second. You got to figure out how many seconds is in a year. That's a big number. You take all those seconds in a year and multiply by that number, you get a hellaciously big number. It's huge. A light year is, you can't imagine. It. But this star is not a light year. It's four light years away. What's that mean? That means that if you go out and you find that star tonight and look at it, you're not seeing the star as, as it exists right now in the present. You're seeing the star as it looked four years ago when the light left. It. That star might not even be there anymore. I mean, it's there, but it may not even be. If it were gone, you wouldn't realize it for four years. Because the light still, you're looking back in the past four years. Think about the number, that distance. You actually have to calculate the distance by taking the number of seconds in four light years, a huge number, and multiply 186,000. Unbelievably big. It gets worse, though. Look, there are planets, there are stars that are hundreds of light years away, thousands of light years away. Mind-blowing. So these numbers here get so big that you don't want to have to write out a bunch of places or decimal places. We need scientific notation. Now, I talked about an extra credit question. Well, it's not an extra credit question, assignment. I'm going to give you, uh, you're already going to get 100 on this first quiz because you're going to come on next time. You're going to say who you are, give me your major, say hello to everybody. Bam, you got 100 points on quiz one. I'm now going to give you an extra credit question. I well, actually have to send you a link. I want you to watch a video on the size of the universe. And this will help you understand why we really need scientific notation. And when you see this video, I guarantee your mind is going to be blown. You're going to think about things in a different way. So uh, I'll send that out here. I don't know. If I, maybe not today, but by tomorrow or next class, 
I'll send it out. So you got two, two easy dates so far. Number one, next time we get together, just introduce yourself. Bam, we got 100 points on quiz one. And then this other one, uh, we call it size of the universe assignment, extra credit. It's going to count as a quiz grade. So now you got 200s going into uh, the semester already. So that sets you up for being, being a better student. So, but you get my point here. Scientists and engineers deal with really big numbers and with small numbers. So let's take this number right here. How would I put that in scientific notes? What would I do? Well, pretty simple to do. All you got to do is, now often what I'll do, I'll erase these commas and I'll just have spaces there. Because in some cultures, they, they use commas for decimal points, so it'd be confusing. Sometimes I'll use a comma, sometimes I won't. If I want to put that number in scientific notation, then all I got to do is first look at the decimal point, which is over here. And then remember, the form says this number has got to be between 1 and 9 inclusive. I may or may not have a number there, times 10 to some power. And that power tells me how many times I got to move the decimal point to make it look like this form, or to this form. And so all I got to do is say, look. I'm going to move this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nine point three times ten to the. I had to move it seven times, but I ain't done yet. I got to do one more thing. I gotta, I gotta indicate if that, if that power is negative or positive. So how do you know if it's negative or positive? Well, the way I do it is this: if I start with a number that's bigger than one. That's going to be positive. If I start with a number, a decimal number that's between 0 and 1, that's going to be negative. So 93 million is, of course, bigger than 1, so I'll leave that as a positive 7. But what if I had this one? What if I gave you one that says uh, I got 0, 0, 0, put a decimal point there, 1, 7, 6. I got that number. I want to put that in scientific notation. Let's do that one. I want to put that in scientific notation. Now, instead of moving the decimal point to the left, I got to move the decimal point to the right. Move the decimal point to the right and go one, two, three. I stop right there. So I got one place to the left of the decimal between one and nine inclusive. So I want to write it as 1.76 times 10 to the, I have to move it one, two, three places. So that's a three. But I'm not done yet. I got to say, all right, is that positive or negative? That exponent, if it's bigger than one, the original number is bigger than one, I leave it as a positive. If the original number is between zero and one, I write it as a negative. This number is a decimal number between zero and one, so I got to write that as a negative number, and then I'm done. So scientific notation is pretty simple to do. But what I want to do, just to make sure everybody can do this, I want to give you some practice problems to do. So if you have the topic sheet, you already got the practice problems. They're at the bottom of the topic sheet. If you don't have the topic sheet, take out a sheet of paper. I'm going to list the problems on the board. But all I want you to do is to just kind of follow and put these numbers in scientific notation. So here is the first set of numbers. Put these in scientific notation. And if you'd like to put the commas in here, you can. I'm going to leave my commas out, at least for the, some of the numbers I will. All All right, so if you have pen and paper, go ahead and put these in scientific notation. I'll give you a second to do it, and then we're going to go over it together.
By now, you should have done the first one. I look at my decimal point. I got to move it over one, two, three. I can't stop there because I got to have one place to left the decimal. So I got to go four times. So this will be 5.6 times 10 to the four. That's what you should have got for that one. And then this one, I got to move it over one, two, three, four, five, six to get there. This is 1.2. Times 10 to the 6 in scientific notation. This one, you got to be careful because you're coming from over here, so that means I'm going to have a negative number when I'm done. For that one. I go 1, 2, so it's 5 times 10 to the 2, but since this number is between 0 and 1, it's a negative 2. This one, 1, 2, 3. So 4.72 times 10 to the 3, and again, it's a negative 3, so I start with a number between 0 and 1, and I hope I got the zeros right here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and I think there were 10 zeros, and if there's 10 zeros, this will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, I think I got that right. Does that check out? Did I do that one right? I think there's 10 zeros. I didn't have my glasses on, so I hope I got that right. Is that what you guys got? Yes, yeah, that's what I got. Now, this one's kind of silly because it's already, you know, I don't know if you can see it with the camera, but it's 1.3. You don't have to move the decimal at all, so you can really leave it like that. But if you want to put it in this form, you can say 1.3 times 10 to the 0. I don't move the decimal at all. That's a non-problem. That's just there to make you think. So you see that this scientific notation, again, most of you, this is a review. You've seen it before. Um, but if you haven't, it's pretty simple. Um, you can actually add, divide, multiply. All in scientific notation, the book may or may not go into that. We don't really have to worry about that. Just know what scientific notation is, why we use it, because we deal with really big numbers and really small numbers. And this is a convenient way to write those numbers and know how to, how to, how to put a number in the scientific notation. And I think they want you to be able to take numbers out of scientific notation. So on the topic sheet, they give you some of those too. So let's do a few of those. And that's kind of, a, I don't know if it's a waste of time, because if you can put it in a scientific notation, you should be able to take it out. But just for the heck of it, let's go ahead and do it since so it's on the paper. I'll put the problems up there in case you don't have your sheet. So all they give us this. They want you to put those or take from scientific notation and put it in decimal form. And I don't know how you guys do it when you do this kind of stuff, but what I do is I just look at this number right here. First I first I know since that's positive, this number has to be bigger than one. So I gotta move the decimal point to the right. So that's pretty pretty easy. But then I know I gotta move it seven times. But I already got two places right here. So to get the seven, I got to add five more places of five zeros. So I'll, I'll, I'll just put this down like that. There's a two, and then one, two, three, four, five zeros. If you want to put your commas in there to make it look a little bit better, you can do that. So I don't know how you do it. Some people can just move and count. Whatever you do, just be able to do it. So this one, I got to move the decimal left. Eight times, but I already got one place there, so I gotta add seven zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I got three, seven, five. 
I'm putting my decimal point here. But anytime you put a leading decimal point, it's, 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 it's nice to put a zero there just to make that decimal point stand out. So put that leading zero in here. Here I got to move it two places, so I got to add a zero. So zero, five, five, one, uh, one, two, and put a leading zero. And here I got to move it four places to the right, but I already got two of the places with the six and the seven. So I'm going to write two zeros, and then I get 16,700. So these are non-problems. If you can get a scientific notation, I'm, I'm sure you can take it out of scientific notation. So that was pretty simple. Now, what we're going to talk about now really applies directly to our class. So you got to be good at what we're going to do now. I want to talk about something called engineering, engineering notation. Engineering notation is a subset of scientific notation. But before I do that, I got to talk about two other things. Well, three other topics. I want to talk about something called a quantity. I'm going to talk about uh, systems of units. And then we'll talk about engineering notation. Oh, nope. Before we talk about that, we got to talk about metric prefixes. And then we'll talk about engineering notation. I don't know why my spell is so bad today. I guess because I'm tired. I feel like I can't spell anything. Okay, so we're going to talk about these three things to get to this. This is where this is the important one right here. We got to talk about these three first. Now, in science or engineering, the term quantity, the thing about being an engineer or a scientist or just a technical person in general, we have words that have very specific meanings. When lay people use words, they use them, they don't, they're, they're not as precise as we are as scientists, engineers, and technical people. So we have very precise meaning for certain words. So quantity is one of those words. A quantity, what is a quantity is a good question. So in quantity, to express a quantity, maybe the better question is how do you express a quantity? To express a quantity, you need two things. You got to have a magnitude Let's just another word for number. And you got to have a unit. To express a physical quantity, the only way to do it, you got to have two things, a magnitude or number and a unit. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is if I have the number 10, that is not a quantity. It's a number, but it's not a quantity. If I say I have 10 volts, that's a quantity. The number 15 it's just a number, it's not a quantity. If I say I have 15 gallons gas, now that's a quantity. The number negative 30 or negative 23 is just a negative number. If I have negative 23 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a quantity. So to express a quantity, a physical quantity, you need two things. You gotta have a magnitude or number, and you got to have a unit. Now, that's it's a simple idea, but you get mad at me sometimes because you forget to give me the unit. You'll say the answer is 23 or negative 23. And on the quiz, it's wrong. If you're expressing a quantity, if you want credit for it, you got to express a quantity using the magnitude and the unit. Now, I know why students do it this way because they don't know what the unit is. So part of the thing you got to do in this class we're going to talk about some quantities that are new. Like most people have heard of volts. 
you probably know a battery in your car is 12 volts. You probably know the, the one, the little double A battery or 1.5 volts. You probably heard of volts. Most people have heard of volts. Probably most people have heard of watts. If you use light bulbs or if you're in the audio and you have speakers, you heard of watts. You might have a 100 watt light bulb or a 100 watt speaker. So most people know about watts. Talk about, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe am uh, amps. I don't know if people, that's for current. We'll talk about other units. Um, to express a quantity, you got to have the unit. Because if you mean 10 volts, but you write 10 amps, or you just put 10, that doesn't give us any information or gives us the wrong information. So on a quiz or exam, if the number is 15 gallons, if that's the answer, and you write 15, I consider that to be wrong. If it's a quantity to be correct, you got to have a number and a unit. And no, I don't give partial credit. I, I, I got UC students that mad at me right now. got a problem kind of right on the quiz. And so they felt like I graded them too hard because I didn't give them uh, partial credit. The kind of right stuff comes from homework. Okay, you got to kind of right. I'll give you a little credit for that. But when you get to the quiz or exam, that's your time to show me you got it not kind of right. You got to get it all the way right. Kind of right is like being halfway pregnant. There's no such thing with me in that. So to get credit for this, if it's a quantity, remember, you need the number and the unit. That's how we express, express physical quantities. Systems of units. Let's talk about systems of units. So that turns out to be important for us. Uh, there are actually many different systems of units. But there's two main systems of units that we use as scientists and engineers. So I'm going to talk about those two. Two systems of units. One is called the English system. Now this one has many names. It's called the English system. It's called the British system. It's called the, the U.S. customary system of units. I just call it the English system. And then there is the metric system. Now, hopefully you guys can see. I'm going I'm to move this. I know there's a glare on the board, and I don't know if I'm writing in that glare or not. I'm going to get rid of this and move this a little bit over. I don't want to be in that glare. Uh, I can just remember this stuff. Okay, so we got the uh, English system. Then we got the metric system. Now, for system we have, we, we got to talk about the, what, what, what kind of quantities are we going to measure. So there's many different quantities, but we'll just do three. For now, we'll do uh, length, M is for length, we'll do mass, M is for mass, and we'll do T, T is for time. We can keep going because there's other quantities that we can that we can go. But in each system, there are what we call standard units. Now, before I talk about the standard units, I got to say a little bit more about the metric system because in the metric system, there's like three subsystems. I can break this out into what system is called CGS. The other subsystem is called MKS. And the, and the last one is called SI. The SI. And this is actually the one that is big in science and engineering, but let's, let's talk about it, all of them. So for the English system, the standard unit of length is the foot. Now, I looked online, I was looking at this one day, I don't know, a couple months ago, and some website said the yard, and some said the foot. I don't think anybody said the inch. It was either the yard or the foot. I was always taught the foot, so that's what I'm going with. So in the English system, the standard unit of length is the foot. There's other units like the mi miles and, and uh, what, uh, I think it's a hectare unit. There's other units. But uh, the standard unit is the foot. Surprisingly, now, you, if you, I don't know if I have any mechanical engineering students, but 
for mass, the standard unit, if you're MET, I know what you're thinking. You know there's a pound force, you know there's a pound mass, and what they taught you was for mass, the pound mass is the unit that we use for mass, but that's actually incorrect. It's a it's a it's a it's an actual unit, but it's not the standard unit for the English system. This is not the standard unit of mass. The actual unit for mass is called a slug. There's a unit called a slug. This pound mass is derived from that. So many slugs. And then for time, it's the second, that lowercase s is second. So these are standard units that we use for the English system. Now, most of the time in science and engineering, we're over here in the metric system. Because in the United States and a few other places, they still use the English system. But most of the places in the world use the metric system because it's supposed to be easier because it's based on 10. So um, let's talk about standard units in the magnetic system. Now, these subsystems kind of say what these are over here. This right here stands for centimeter. This is CGS system. Centimeters, gram, seconds. So in that subsystem, the standard unit of length is the centimeter. The standard unit of mass is the gram. And for time, it's the second. And in this part of the metric system, MKS, the MKS system, the standard unit of length is the meter. For mass, is the kilogram. And for time, it's the second. So, so far, the second is the same in all the, it's the same in every unit, every every system of units. It's, time is always seconds. Now, what about this SI system? How does that work? What does that look like? Well, in the SI system, the standard unit of length is the meter. The standard unit of mass is the kilogram. And the standard unit for time is the second. And what you should be saying to yourself right now is, well, hold on a second, Singleton. It looks like the MKS and the SI are exactly the same. Meter, meter, kilogram, kilogram, second, second. And for those, they are the same, but there's one thing I don't have over here. There's one more fundamental physical quantity that's important. Lift, mass, and time. There's also temperature. If I add temperature to this list, in the English system, the standard way we measure temperature is just using a unit called Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. And for both the CGS and the MKS, it's the degrees Celsius. But over here, the standard temperature is capital K, and that stands for Kelvin. The Kelvin is what we call an absolute scale. So it's not degrees Kelvin, it's just, just the number, uh, a number of uh, Kelvins. And so that's how the SI system and the MKS system differ from each other, if I add temperature to it. But other than that, MKS and SI, uh, you can pretty much consider those the same. We use all three of these. We use this one or these two most of the time. But later on in the class, we'll talk about magnetism. It turns out that even though this class is about electricity, uh, electricity and magnetism kind of go together. You can't have one without the other. And so when we talk about magnetism, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get into these units. We'll have to know a little bit more about those units. So write this stuff down, or you got the video, you'll be able to watch the video. You don't have to memorize this stuff, but you do want to know, you know, you want to be aware of what these, like the C, the G, and the S, and you want to know what they mean. And you might wonder, well, uh, why, why do I have a CGS and MKS in the metric system? Remember, scientists measure things and get data. And if the thing I'm measuring is really, really small, you probably want to use centimeters. 
if the thing I'm measuring is, is really, really big, we want to use meters or maybe even kilometers. So that's why we have these two different substances. The other thing about units is this. What's the difference between a, a unit that's capitalized and one that's not capitalized? <clears throat> What's the difference? Well, for example, you might get a light bulb. You might get a light bulb that's 75 watts. You might have a 75 watt light bulb or a 100 watt light bulb. And when you write that, you write the W as a capital W. But if I have uh, 75, uh, let's say 75 meters, I don't write a capital M, I write a lowercase m for meters. And the difference between a unit that's capitalized and one that's not capitalized is the one that's capitalized is named after an individual, a scientist, engineer, some, some important person. So if you're, if you're smart and famous enough to get a unit named after you, that capitalizes it. So this Watts, there was an actual scientist named Watts. I think it was James Watts. I think he was an American. It might have been English or somebody. But there's a person named Watts. They got a unit named after him. There wasn't a Mr. or Mrs. Meter. There wasn't, that's not a person's name. That's lowercase. Okay, so the systems of units. I'll ask about this at some point, probably in the quiz, or this will pop up some kind of way. All right, so that's that. So we got a quantity. To express a quantity, I need the magnitude and I need the unit. We talked about systems of units, so there's a lot of different systems we can use, but the main ones to be aware of is the English and metric. You can see the metric has these subsystems. Now there's one more thing I want to talk about, and then I want to get the engineering notation. Now I don't really like having you guys memorize a lot of stuff. I think you really what you want to do is understand it, not memorize it. If you understand it, then you don't need to memorize it. But you probably need to memorize this if you don't already know it. I'm going to give you this table. This is called the table of metric prefixes. And in this table of metric prefixes, what's in the table is the prefix, there's a prefix, there's a power of 10, I'll just say power, and then there's a symbol. And you got to know all three of these for a certain number of prefixes. So the first prefix is mega. Mega. You got mega. You got kilo. You got milli. You got micro. You got nano and then pico. So mega, kilo, milli, micro, nano, pico. You got to know these. Along with these, you got to know the power of 10 associated with each one of these. So mega is 10 to the 6. Kilo is 10 to the 3rd. Milli 10 to the minus third, micro, 10 to the minus six, nano, 10 to the minus nine, and pico, 10 to the minus 12. So you got to know that. And then the last thing you got to know is there's a symbol associated with each prefix. The symbol for mega is a capital M. Kilo is a lowercase k. Milli is a lowercase m. Now let me pause for a second. Look at mega and milli. This is a capital M. This is a lowercase m. When you make your m, some of you make a capital M like this. You just make your capital M a bigger little m. A capital M actually has points on it like that. 
And if I see that, I don't care how big you make it, if I see that, to me, that's a lowercase m. And if you read that and mean this, it's wrong. So what I'm saying is when you, when you when we're referring to mega, if you're using this symbol, make sure you don't make your capital M like that. Make it make it look like a capital M so I know. Again, if you if you're out in the field or you're on you get on some job and you mean you mean milli millivolts, but you write megavolts or vice versa, vice versa, kill somebody. So it's very important you get that right. Micro, micro looks like this. It looks like the letter U, but it has a tail on it. That's the Greek letter mu. So you just make it like a U with a tail on it. So it's like that. Nano is a lowercase n, and pico is a lowercase p. So this table, normally, if we weren't, you know, doing the web stuff, if we were face to face, this would be on your first quiz. And what I would do is I mix this up, erase certain things. You have to fill the table back in and get the whole thing right. But I can't do that since we're doing this web stuff. So you just, you know, I'm gonna trust you. You gotta know that. You gotta know these, and you gotta know these like you know your address. You just gotta know code and these. If not, you're gonna have a hard time. So study this table. Now we're ready for engineering notation. So let's talk about engineering notation. engineering notation as a subset of scientific notation. In engineering notation, in scientific notation, remember, in scientific notation, you can have uh, one place to the left of the decimal. You may or may not have a number there. And then this times 10 to the power. And the way that power is determined is by how many times you got to move the decimal point to get it to the norm and which direction you came to tell if it's negative or positive. So we've done that just a little while ago. With engineering notation, you can have one place to the left of the decimal times 10 to some power. You can have two places to the left of the decimal times 10 to some power. Or you can have three places to the left of the decimal times 10 to some power. So in scientific notation, you can only have one place to the left. With engineering notation, you can have one place to the left, two places to the left, or three places to the left. But just like scientific notation, that leading place should not be a zero. Now, I'm saying that it shouldn't be a zero, so for now it should be a zero, but later on when you do this, you'll probably put a zero in front. It's not a big deal. But strictly speaking, it should be between one and nine, inclusive, so so should these. It shouldn't be a zero on the, the first one. So... In engineering notation, I can have one place to the left, two places to the left, or three places to the left. And in addition to that, the power has to be a multiple of three. So it can be a three, it can be a nine, it could be a 12. It's got to be a multiple of three. That's what, the, that's what determines if you have one place to the left, two places to the left, or three places to the left. you got to negotiate and move that decimal point around so that you have a form like one of these and at the same time have this as a multiple of three. So that's going to determine how many places to the left you have. So if we go back to our first example, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, we said was 93 million miles. And I asked you to put that in scientific notation and you did it. He said, all right, that's easy. I start here. I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I write this as 9.3 times 10 to the 7. And that 7 is positive because the number I started with was bigger than 1. That's scientific notation. If I told you to put it in engineering notation, even though I have one place to the left, which is that form, that fits that form, what doesn't fit is this right here has to be a multiple of three. So that won't work. That's, that's seven. But it will work instead of moving over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I back up one right here, if I back up one, then I have to knock that down to a six. 
So if I write this as 93 times 10 to the 6, now that's in engineering notation. And here's what you do. Once I have the number in engineering notation, let's say that my uh, let's say that my 93 times 10 to the 6. Let's say it's a quantity. So if it's a quantity, I need a number and a unit. And let's say the unit is watts. Watts. Well, if that's my quantity in engineering notation, and what I can do, once I get an engineering notation, I can take this right here, that power of 10, and I can come over here to my table and figure out which power that is. That's mega. I can replace the power of 10 with the symbol. So I can write this as 93 megawatts. And that's what you got to be able to do for this class. You got to be able to do that cold. So that's why this table is important. Once you get an engineering notation, then you can substitute the power of 10 like this. And this is how electrical engineers talk. They're not going to say 93 million watts. They're not going to say 93 times 10 to the 6 watts. They're going to say 93 megawatts is the way they talk about it. Okay? So what I want to do now is um, practice some of this. Let's practice putting some numbers in engineering notation. And I'm going to get rid of this. I hope, well, maybe I can leave that up here. I'm going to get rid of this. And we're going to use the same set of numbers that we use for scientific notation. Only on the topic sheet, he tells you to make those numbers quantities now. So I got to give him a unit. And I think he says he used the volts. So we're going to use the same set of numbers that we use for scientific notation. Only we're going to assume that they're all volts. So the first number was 56,000. So we're going to say it's 56,000 volts. And then we have for the next one, this one, again, volts. Do I have a right number? Yeah. And then this one, volts. So I'm going to pause for a second, and there are, I think that's all of them. You guys put those in engineering notation. Oh, don't confuse when I have, remember I had, a, I, had well, I had 93 times 10 to the 6 uh, was watts. Do not, if on the test or quiz I say put some in engineering notation, this is engineering notation. Sometimes students will start with a decimal number. And they'll jump right to this. They'll say 93 megawatts. This is not engineering notation. This is engineering notation. So if I say, the question will probably say, put this number in engineering notation. So I want to see it written like that. Then substitute the power of 10 for the correct metric prefix. If I say that, then you would take that and we write it like that. So don't confuse engineering notation with the substituted uh, symbol over here. This is engineering notation. So now go ahead and put these all in engineering notation and my units are I'm going to go ahead and erase this table. You got it on the video. You can watch it later. So go ahead and do that. Winding down now, get to the end. So I'm going to do this, and I got one more part I want to talk about, and that'll be it for today. We'll have a short lecture today.
All right, but now you should have done at least the first one. So let's look at the first one. If I put this in engineering notation, you should have got, I got to move it over one, two, three. So it would be 56 times 10 to the third volts. And then if I substitute out, put in the correct uh, prefix symbol, it will be 56. I replace this with the lowercase k. So you would say 56 kilovolts. If I do this one, I got to move it over. One, two, three, four, five, six to get it in the proper form. I'll get 1.2 times 10 to the 6 volts. And if I substitute, I get 1.2 megavolts. Now, this one, you got to be careful because you got to move it over one. Two, then you run out of digits. So what you do is you add a zero. So if I add a zero, it's going to be 50. If I move it over one, two, and add a zero, I can move it one more time. 50 times 10 to the, but I would have moved it one, two, three times. So minus third volts, and that would be 50 millivolts. So notice how my capital M looks capital and my lowercase m looks lowercase. Megavolts and millivolts are a big difference between the two. So say what you mean and mean what you say. This one is kind of the same way. I would have uh, one, two, three. So it's 4.72 times 10 to the minus third or 4.72 millivolts. And then the last one, I think there were 10 zeros, so I'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I got to move it over 12 places. Like that. It's up to that, and I will get 56. That would be picovolts. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny voltage. So this is probably uh, one of the most important things we've talked about so far today. You got to be able to do this, and you got you got to know your units. We're gonna have we're gonna have a couple. We'll have volts. We'll have uh, amps. We'll have watts. We'll have some kind of ohm. Some kind of joule. And we'll have something called a coulomb. Those will be the units we use. You'll get to know them, but you got to know the unit to write, and then you got to substitute out the correct symbol from the table uh, of the prefixes of metric metric prefixes. So you'll get used to it. The main ones are going to be volts, amps, and ohms, and watts. Okay, so um, I'll say look in your book, the textbook. If you got your book, um, you can look in that. You guys have to buy that book online through the bookstore. Um, if you don't have it, I don't think you need it for what we're doing here. But and, and for homework, I'm probably going to just uh, type out the homework problems for you instead of using problems in the back of the book. Because people get different editions of the book, and they're not all the same. So we'll see how that works out. So any questions so far? I got one more topic to talk about, and then we're done for today. But we went over a lot so far. Um, hopefully, a lot of it was reviewed. But if not, I have any questions over anything we talked about so far. Well, if you don't, I'm going to uh, do the last thing on the topic sheet, which deals with measured numbers. So let's talk about that, and then we'll call it a night.
All right. So at the bottom of the top sheet, the last thing to talk about is measured numbers. A measured number, when you measure something, it's going to give you a quantity. Remember, a quantity consists of a number and a unit. So by measured number, by measured numbers, I'm referring to quantities. But realize that wh where do we get these measured numbers from? Well, as engineers or scientists or technical people, we're going to get these from some kind of a experiment, some kind of lab. So the measured numbers are referring to something you would get during some kind of application or some kind of a lab. And what I have are these four terms that apply to measured numbers, or numbers that you will get in lab. Now, what would I use to measure? I mean, what, what, how do I, what, do I, what device do I use to measure? And the, the answer is depending on what it is you're measuring. Uh, for example, in our class, the main thing we're going to measure with is that meter I told you you need, the digital multimeter. With that meter, you can measure voltage, you can measure current, and you can, me you can measure resistance. Those are the three things you can measure with any multimeter. Some multimeters, you can measure other stuff like temperature, RPMs, all of that. But every, any and every meter will allow you to measure the big three, voltage, current, and resistance. And so, uh, but you can have other devices to take other measurements. You know, if you, you know, maybe you want to make sure you don't have the coronavirus, you might take your temperature. That is a device designed to measure temperature thermometer. Or you might uh, use a tape measure to measure the height of something. Any measurement you make will give you quantity because you'll have a number, 10 feet, and you'll have or 10, and you'll have a height, feet. So that's a quantity. So this refers to stuff that we'll get in the lab. And so what I want to do is make sure that we, as we speak lab language, as we speak about things in lab, that we're using these terms the way we mean the usual in lab. And the very first one is called a significant digit. Now, I'll be the first to say, I've had chemistry a whole year of it when I was in college. And chemists are big on what they call sig figs, significant digits, in, 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 in physics too. But, so if you're a chemistry for, I had a chemist in my class, not this past semester, yeah, it was this past semester. I had a chemist in the class. He was taking it. And uh, so the, the way the, the way I'm going to define this, if you're a chemist, you're going to be really unhappy. I'm going to give you the definitions that apply, that I want you to apply the way we're going to use them in our class. So that's the way I'm going to get it. If you're a chemist person, you're not going to like it. A chemistry person, I mean. So significant digit for us is the number of a measurement known to be correct the number of a measurement known to be correct. What does that mean, the number of a measurement known to be correct? Well, what that means is, let's say I want to measure some quantity, you know, mass, a time, whatever the quantity is. Let's say I want to measure the length of this line. How would I measure the length of the line? Well, I got to have some kind of measuring device. If I want to measure the weight of something, I got to have a scale. If I want to measure the mass of something, I got some kind of balance beam. If I want to measure the temperature, I got to have a thermometer. If I want to measure the length of something, I could use some kind of a, like a measuring stick, like a rule, some kind of ruler. So maybe I have a scale that I use, this measuring device, and I don't care what the units are. I'm just going to put units here. It could be centimeters, inches, whatever you want. And what I'm going to do is put some, I call it tick marks, in here like this. So I'm going to divide those up. And now I'm going to measure this. Now, they teach you in physics that when you make a measurement with like a meter stick or whatever, you never start from the end because the end could be worn down from people hitting it on the ground and all of that. But let's say we have a perfect meter stick. And I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven units, whatever the units are. How long is that line? Well, if I say how long, how long is the line, you might say it's, uh, let's see, I got one, two, three, four. Looks like, a, to me, it looks like about 4.75. I got one, two, three, four. It's about 4.75. Somebody else might look and say, nah, that looks like 
9.5 to me. Somebody else might say, no, it looks like 4.8. You can argue over anything after the decimal point. But what you can't argue about is that we know it's at least 4. In all these cases, it's 4. So for us in our class, we talk about a significant digit. It's the number that we're sure about. And for the only thing we're sure about here is the 4. So we can say it's 4 units, 4 inches, 4 whatever. Anything other than that, like this part, this part, this part, that's just a guess. So that is what we mean by significant digit. Now, the next one is error. Error. So when I say error, what is error? <coughs> excuse me. Error refers to error in the measurement. You, you're measuring something and there's error in it. So what does that mean? And really, not so much what does it mean, but where does it come from is the more important question. So I think we all know what error is. Error is getting something other than the real value when you make a measurement. But the real question is, where does the error come from? And the answer to that is, it comes from one of two places, or maybe two of two places. Error either comes from, there's either something wrong with the instrument you're using to make the measurement, like for here, maybe somebody was hitting this on the ground and part of this got worn away, all the way up to here. So this whole part is gone, so one, two, three, I'll go one, two, I'm reporting the three or so before. That's that's error. There's something wrong with the instrument, or there's something wrong with, with me as a human, the way I'm probably the way I'm reading the instrument. So error, the important thing about error is to know where it comes from. It is it, it's gonna come from either human error or error error in the instrument itself. Um if if you look at them, I don't know if you ever looked at something with a, like a, a, a something that's metered with a meter on it. Let's say I got a scale like this. And I got some kind of needle that moves back and forth. So maybe the needle is pointing right there. So this could be a scale that measures bolt, sound, whatever. It doesn't really matter what you measure. But the point is, it's pointing right here. The needle's pointing right there. And you're going to read that and report the data, report the value back. How you look at that scale determines what reading you get. You, if you look at it over here like that, if you, if you have a small instrument, now on the board it doesn't, this, my, my example might not work too well, but if you look at a small actual little meter, if you look at it over here, you might report one value. You look over here, you might report another value. The best place to look is right over it to get the exact value. Matter of fact, back at the school and lab, we have meters like this. These are called analog meters. Analog. The ones that light up with the display, those are digital meters. But the old analog meters, some of them will have a mirror, a shiny mirror right here. Like that. And it's called a mirrored scale and the purpose of the mirror is if you're making the measurement and you can see the reflection of the needle then you're not looking at it the right way what you got to do is move your, your eye over it so that the reflection and the needle are right right over each other and then you're looking at it head on the reason is they realize that the angle at which you make a measurement can affect the value so that's what I meant when I said air can come from the way that you're, you're taking the measurement, the way you're looking at it. So in short, error comes from either human error or there's error in the measuring device itself. Now that's important because let's say you're doing a lab for me and you do the lab and you do calculations and you get the data and the data match, it doesn't match with your calculation. You say, now there's something wrong here. I, I made some kind of mistake. But you can't take the lab over, but you want credit for the lab, so what would you do? What you would do is try to explain the source of the error and know that it will come from one or two places, or I should say two or two places. It could be something wrong with the measuring device, the meter could be wrong, or whatever you're using. It could be something that you did wrong as a person. So error comes from one or two places. 
So that is significant digit in air. Now, the most important thing to remember, though, is the last two. That's what I really want to get to. And if I ask on the quiz, I probably won't say too much about significant digit or error, but these right here are important. These two I will ask you about, accuracy and precision. Let me just read the definition I have on the topic sheet, and I want to show you how you would express that, um, how I can show you a, a pictorial way of understanding it. So for accuracy, what we have for definition is how close you are to the true value. Now remember what we're talking about. We're talking about making measured numbers. So I have some kind of device that's, that's making this measurement for me, a scale, the monitor, meter, some kind of measuring device. And so what I'm saying is that accurate, when I say the device is accurate, we're saying how close you are to the true value. How close is that measurement to the true value? That's what we mean by accuracy. Precision is how often you hit the same value. How often you hit the same value. So what I've seen over the years, probably in chemistry, to, to explain the difference between accuracy and precision, they have a like a a board, a dart board. So you got a dart board. So you're gonna throw darts. And so you got the bullseye in the middle, or maybe you hit arrows. I guess it's a, it's a bullseye if you're shooting arrows at this. But you know you got a dart board like this. You've seen these boards. The target, I guess I should say a target. Maybe I should call it target. So you got a target. And the, the center of the target represents the actual value, the true value of whatever it is you're measuring. The, the target itself are measurements that you're making. And what you're going to do is you're going to, the measurement, the analogy is you're throwing a dart or arrow at this, and that's the measurement you're getting. And so let's say you have darts you're throwing. You, you got a green one. You throw the dart, and it lands on this value right here. You got a red one, you throw the red dart, and it lands on this value right here. And you throw one more dart, you throw a blue dart, and it lands on that value right there. So what would you say about, about that person that threw the dart? Is that person accurate or precise? Well, that person, if it's precise, we hit the same spot over and over again. They're not accurate, because if they were accurate, they hit the bullseye. But they're precise because they hit the same target, the same spot, over and over again. So let's say they do it again. They throw the green one. This time they hit right here. They throw the red one. This time they hit right here. And then finally they throw the blue one. And they hit right here. Now what would you say about it? Well, they're accurate because they hit the actual value. And they're also precise because they hit the same value over and over again. So the lesson here is, if you're accurate, then if you're accurate, by definition, you're also precise. But it's possible to be precise without being accurate. Now remember, we're talking about some kind of a measuring device. So I can have a scale that's very precise, but it may not be accurate. It might be 10 pounds off. I get on it and uh, I measure, I, I weigh 210 pounds, I get off of it, get back on it, it's 210 pounds, no matter how many times, it's still 210 pounds, but that's not my actual weight, I might be 195, so I get this repeatability is what I mean by precision, accuracy is how close to the actual value I get, and so one way to demonstrate that is with this dark board, and so if I ask about that on a quiz, and you want to use this to, to show your understanding of it, just draw this picture, and then you would say precise, and you say accurate for that. You know, then I, I would know what you're saying. Wow. So by my clock now, it's 8.06, and we started at a little bit after 6 o'clock, 6.05. So I've been talking for two hours, and most of you stuck with me. You've been listening for two hours. That's pretty good. But I think we're done for today. Does anybody have any questions or comments over anything we talked about? So far, any questions or comments? If you do, 
have a question or comment or you think of something, I put a number on the board. You can text me, you can email me. Um, I will, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll meet next time. Was it Thursday? We'll meet at the same time. But all of our classes won't be right at 6 o'clock. So you want to make sure you follow Blackboard. Most of the time, they'll probably be around that time. But sometimes uh, I'll give you assignments you do at home. I might not lecture first, I lecture at all. Sometimes I might do a pre-recorded thing where I use PowerPoints. It just depends on the nature of the material. So make sure you follow Blackboard. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to look at the syllabus and then uh, our, your uh, module one on Blackboard, you'll find the topic sheet there. You want to look for the assignments I'm going to give you. I'll give you one that's going to count as a quiz. Quiz one will be some questions that you answer. Next time we, you get online, you'll introduce yourself. that will count as quiz one. I want to give you uh, an assignment. How big is the universe assignment where you'll watch a video for me uh, and you'll write a summary of it. This is to help you understand uh, why we use scientific notation and, and things like it. And then uh, there'll be a homework at some point. Homework one will be coming. So if you have any questions or comments over any of those, you can send me a text. And if, you, if there are no questions, um, there's one last thing. If you do have questions, once the session is over, I can keep the camera on. And I'll stop recording, but I'll keep the, the camera on. So if you ever have a problem that we need to work out, I can stop the recording. We can still meet after class through the video. So that's an option if we if we need that. Well, guys, you have a great rest of the day, a rest of the night, and I will see you, uh, I think, on Thursday. Thank you. I do have one quick question, real fast, before you sure. end it. Let me uh, turn the recorder off, and then uh, I will answer your question.